1st May 2017, Valletta, Malta, just outside the Prime Minister's office at the Auberge de Castile. The Prime Minister has summoned his supporters for a political meeting, ostensibly to mark May Day, a traditional peg in his Labour Party's calendar. But these are strange times. The political fever is at its most intense, even if, in theory, a general election is more than a year away. Joseph Muscat is angry. He speaks of the biggest lie in Maltese political history and that he is its victim. The people will have to decide, he says. The country cannot be run by a prime minister under the shadow of scandal, not without confirming the people's trust in him. An election is called a year ahead of time. And that would settle the matter once and for all. Or would it? 22nd February 2016. It's traditional to eat lamb on Easter Sunday, so Conrad Mitzi and his estranged wife, Sai Mitzi Liang, will be getting theirs from New Zealand, courtesy of their fixer, Brian Tonner, who has a desk at the Auberge de Castile. When I say that I have an international network of spies, I'm not quite joking, but sadly, I can't say more for now, though I'm bursting to. Daphne Caruana Galizia is Malta's foremost journalist. By 2016, she has racked up some 30 years of experience in the industry. She is equally respected and hated. Sought after for her incisive analysis and her groundbreaking investigations, admired for her acid wit, feared for her merciless and uncompromising criticism of wrongdoing and moral ambiguity. When Joseph Muscat came to power in 2013, she was far from his biggest fan. She was critical of his character, his style, or as she saw it, his lack of it, and his politics, hollow, grasping, and cynical. During the first three years of his administration, she documented episodes of bad governance. Debts owed to the government by party donors or by the Labour Party itself were forgiven. Jobs in government were gifted to cronies. Building permits were granted against the rules to Labour loyalists. Her blog, Running Commentary, became a catalogue of scandal a week. Some weeks, a scandal a day. But in the beginning of 2016, Daphne Caruana Galizia knows she has come up with the story to trump them all. She cannot say much for now, so she drops hints about New Zealand lamb for Easter and the odd fit of Panama fedoras on ministers. Her readers sense that something is coming, but the only ones who know more than Daphne about what Daphne is hinting at are the perpetrators she is about to expose. A few days later, Daphne Caruana Galizia reports that the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Keith Schembri, and his Energy Minister, formerly the Labour Party's star candidate, Conrad Mitzi, hold, in their own names, companies in Panama, set up a few days after Labour came into office in 2013. The companies are folded into trusts registered in New Zealand. The Panama hats and the cute lamb now make sense. This piece of information should have never emerged except for an unbelievable coincidence, incredibly inconvenient to Mitzi and Schembri. Of all the mid-ranking worker bees in all the bent law firms in all the secretive offshore financial jurisdictions in the world, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists have a source inside Mossack Fonseca, the Panamanian law firm that worked with Brian Tonner, the accountant of choice for the rotten and the corrupt of Malta. Conrad Mitzi and Keith Schembri, like hundreds of Mossack Fonseca clients throughout the world, have no idea that their secrets are about to be exposed so spectacularly. Their reading of Daphne Caruana Galizia's hints and stories is that she must have stumbled upon some details without any understanding of the full picture, they can deal with Daphne the way they have always dealt with her. Accuse her of lying, deny her accusations, discredit her. For a while, it works. Until the ICIJ publishes the Panama Papers and all the world can now see that Daphne Caruana Galizia has not been lying at all. The scandal is out. The New Zealand lamb, headless, roasted and fragrant, hops back into life. The two politicians closest to Joseph Muscat had set up secret offshore companies when they came to power. 
It must have cost them thousands to set them up. They sought to evade tax, but that is hardly the worst problem. They are caught setting up a nest to hide their illegal gains, money they were never supposed to earn. And then, when they were exposed, they lie about it all, accusing the journalist who made public their misdeeds of inventing the whole thing. It is reasonable to expect their resignation at least, but how will this affect Joseph Muscat? He trusts them. They both work in his office, together with their accountant, Brian Tonner. They have been his choice as the most senior generals to run the country. How can he survive this politically? And then, something incredible happens. Nothing. Nothing happens. Nobody resigns. No police investigations are opened. No contracts are examined. No debate. No condemnation. Nothing. Joseph Muscat insists that Keith Schembri had been a businessman in his own right. Setting up offshore companies to avoid paying tax is, Malta's Prime Minister says, par for the course. Conrad Mitzi pays a fine to the tax authorities for hiding the existence of his Panama company. He resigns the deputy leadership of the Labour Party and he is rebranded as minister in the Prime Minister's office. That, Joseph Muscat insists, is sufficient punishment. On with the show. The Panama Papers reveal more about the shady services Brian Tonner provides to his clients in politics. He has set up a British Virgin Islands company for himself to hide some of the profits he made, including from selling passports. Out of those profits, he paid a share to Keith Schembri in an account he set up for him at Pilatus Bank. Brian Tonner also set up an offshore company for one Cheng Chen an official who negotiated on behalf of Shanghai Electric the part privatization of Malta's state-owned electricity provider, Enimalta. And Tonna's long-standing arrangements with Keith Schembri preceded Schembri's time in politics. The Panama Papers expose how structures set up for Schembri by Tonna allowed Schembri to pay kickbacks to Adrian Hillman, until this point the managing director of Allied Newspapers Limited, publishers of Malta's newspaper of record, Times of Malta. The kickbacks were paid in exchange for a ruinous acquisition that Adrian Hillman forced the Times of Malta into, buying a printing press that only Keith Schembri's businesses could supply. Adrian Hillman is forced to resign, protesting his innocence, while the Times of Malta's reputation for independence is severely damaged. Its editorial line that in the years leading up to 2013, during which the kickbacks were being paid to Adrian Hillman, had been sympathetic to Joseph Muscat and his Labour Party, comes under fresh scrutiny in the light of these revelations. For supporters of the government and the Labour Party, however, it is enough that Joseph Muscat pronounces himself unperturbed by the details exposed by Daphne Caruana Galizia and the Panama Papers. Neither Keith Schembri nor Conrad Mitzi, Joseph Muscat insists, have done anything wrong, and that is the end of that. Joseph Muscat's vehemence comforts his supporters in suppressing a nagging doubt. There is a third Panama company, E. Grant, set up on the same day as Mitzi's and Schembri's. Its owner is not known. Why is Joseph Muscat intent on defending Mitzi and Schembri? Is he perhaps the third player, as yet unexposed? 12th May 2017 Christian I am extremely annoyed at your lawyer's high-handed attitude and more than annoyed at the fact that a company feels itself empowered to sell a country's citizenship against the will of the citizens of that country and by underhand agreement with a government that does not have an electoral mandate for it and then has the sheer brass neck to begin going after journalists and real citizens of that country who object to it. I do not appreciate your threat to sue me in London. The reason you're doing it is not because, quote, most of your business is there, unquote. Most of your business comes from shady people in Russia and the Middle East, with the occasional Vietnamese MP thrown in. The reason you're threatening to sue me in London is because you imagine that I'm somebody from the sticks who is frightened by the words London, UK courts and high costs. Daphne Caruana Galizia publishes an exchange she had with Christian Kalin, 
The Swiss lawyer who runs Henley & Partners, the firm Joseph Muscat contracted to sell Malta's citizenship to anyone willing and able to pay for it. She is replying to his threats to sue her in the UK if she does not stop writing about the scheme. She had been one of the first critics of the idea of selling Maltese citizenship to people unconnected with the island, and while others were silenced by the temptation of sharing in the profits, she persisted, exposing scandal after scandal of passport buyers who use Malta to dodge tax or worse. Her journalism does not merely cause embarrassment to the government, it damages the viability of the scheme itself. Crooks buy Maltese passports to hide where they are really from, and by extension, who they really are. They hope to squeeze unnoticed past border control and customs checks. They hope to travel without the inconvenience of visa applications, and to push their money around, hiding it behind the privileges enjoyed by citizens of an EU country. That wouldn't work if their cover is blown by Daphne Caruana Galizia's reporting. A simple Google search would link them again to their past, which they have spent hundreds of thousands of euros to hide. Henley and Partners must be the most unpopular outfit in Malta right now, after Pilatus Bank, an outfit owned by somebody who bought a St. Kitts and Nevis passport from you, and that other outfit, run by Joseph Muscat and Keith Schembri, with whom you signed an agreement decided upon before they came to power. It's a small world. And Malta is a tiny, tiny part of it. But even here, some coincidences are unlikely. Within a few months of coming to power, Joseph Muscat's government contracted Henley and Partners to sell Maltese passports. A holder of a St. Kitts and Nevis passport, or two, maybe more, to set up a European bank in Malta. Ali Sadra had acquired his passport from Henley and Partners. The fact that he's originally from Iran, a sanctioned country, can now be conveniently forgotten. His so-called bank is a funny little outfit. It's in Tajbish, in a seafront apartment block, on the floor between the British and the German embassies, with 10 employees and a sign on the door. So, what is Pilatus Bank up to? Were it not for Daphne Kawana Galizia and her sources, we'd likely never have known. As it happens, it is a money laundering machine, a laundromat, a bank that systematically ignores rules on the scrutiny it ought to perform on the provenance of deposits made by its clients precisely because it thrives on these retainers that would not be accepted elsewhere. The bank handles some 180 accounts, but between them, the deposits run into billions. Depositors include one of the heirs of Eduardo dos Santos, the late tyrant of Angola, and the client's list has a disproportionate representation of the profligate family of Ilham Aliyev, the Pasha of Azerbaijan. A river of dirty money flows through Pilatus Bank, coming out clean on the other side, as it finds its way into the properties and holdings of Pilatus's clients in London, Miami and elsewhere. Once again, the key is secrecy. Washing dirty money is like melting stolen jewellery. You don't want people to see you do it. You especially don't want a journalist to learn from a whistleblower on the inside what your bank is up to. Unlike Christian Kalin from Henley & Partners, the owner of Pilatus Bank doesn't bother to threaten Daphne. He just goes ahead and files a $40 million lawsuit in Arizona, USA. Pilatus Bank's clients are, in the most part, shady, jet-setting billionaires. But its client list includes one Keith Schembri. He receives in his Pilatus account deposits paid to him by Brian Tonna. But why doesn't he deposit the money in a high street bank account, such as his Bank of Valletta accounts? Keith Schembri denies any wrongdoing. The money is a repayment of a loan he advanced to Brian Tonna to cover him during an expensive divorce. End of story. There is yet another notable account holder at Pilatus Bank. His name is John Dully. Well, John Dully was... Um originally quite a well-respected politician in Malta. Um, I'm talking as far back as 1987. And he won the respect of a lot of people because he took decisive action at a time when Malta's economy and Malta generally was in a real mess. And then slowly and slowly, there began to be whisperings and um, conversations, private conversations, 
about how corrupt he is. He was the minister responsible for privatization of state entities in Malta, including the banks, the airport. And there were these sort of um, undercurrents um, about his involvement, his maybe taking a cut. The opposition at the time, which was the Labour Party, used to call him, in fact, Johnny Cash, because he had such a reputation for going after money. But yet, you know, mm -hmm. still no really no smoking gun. No, there's no smoking gun. Eventually, um, the Nationalist Prime Minister made what I consider to be, and many people consider to be, a fatal error, which was to um, nominate him as Malta's commissioner, European commissioner, so as to get him off, off, off his island. own back and off the island, he exported the problem and inflicted it on a European-wide level. 16th October 2012, three o'clock in the afternoon. The European Commission issues a statement announcing that its president, Jose Barroso, has accepted John Danley's resignation. The resignation comes after the EU's anti-fraud agency, OLAF, has uncovered evidence that a henchman for John Danley, his slema fixer, Silvio Zamit, had solicited a 60 million euro bribe from a Swedish tobacco company in return for a change in the EU's laws that banned the product they produced. John Dunley would eventually give his account of what happened that day. He would confirm that the first phone call he made after being fired and leaving President Barroso's office was to Joseph Muscat, then still the leader of the opposition. Olaf passed their evidence against John Dunley to the Malta police. Almost immediately, they charged Silvio Zamit with bribery and corruption. The police also asked John Dunley to fly to Malta to answer their questions in person. But John Dunley replies that he is too ill to travel. He has medical certificates issued by a gynecologist to prove it. Joseph Muscat becomes Prime Minister the following March. One of his first decisions is to replace the police chief who wanted to charge John Dunley, and the new boy immediately announces that he finds no wrongdoing in John Dunley's actions. Miraculously, John Dunley is cured. He flies to Malta and proceeds directly to the Prime Minister's office. There, at a press conference, Joseph Muscat announces that John Dunley will advise him on national health matters. It is the political area he had been responsible for at the European Commission before he was fired. By now, John Dunley has accumulated many reasons for despising Daphne Caruana Galizia. She has covered minor scandals he had been involved in when he was a minister in Malta, scandals that forced his temporary exile from frontline politics. And during his tenure as commissioner, she exposed him for using companies registered in the names of his daughters that swindled a group of elderly people in America who thought they were investing their savings to help poor people in Africa, but were instead, unwittingly, lining John Dunley's pockets. While he was supposed to oversee the health policy of the entire European continent, John Dunley hopped on John to the Bahamas to conspire with his accomplices. It is amazing enough that he found the time, except if you think about it, he also found time to make repeated trips to Malta to try to persuade the then PN government to change its energy supply plans and to build a gas-fired power station supplied from a nearshore tanker. The PN government does not like the idea and sends him away, only to see John Dudley explain his great plan for a gas-fired power station on the TV station owned by the opposition Labour Party. That power station idea will eventually come back to life. But it will need Joseph Muscat to be elected, Conrad Mitzi to be appointed energy minister, and John Dunley to fly back to Malta. Another plan needs hatching. After naming John Dunley as his health advisor, Joseph Muscat kicks out his unforgivably honest health minister, Godfrey Faruja, and replaces him with his favorite and considerably more accommodating, Conrad Mitzi. Their plan will be the ultimate betrayal of the ideological tradition of the Labour Party the privatization of a huge chunk of the National Health Service. 23rd November, 2016. They say that young people aren't interested in what's going on. But in both the Brexit referendum and in the US presidential election, they've turned out to be the ones with their heads screwed on properly, while their parents and grandparents stampeded towards the cliff edge. This is the best informed and most insightful piece I have read so far about the highly suspect privatisation of Malta's public hospitals, and it's written by a medical student. It should, of course, have been written 
by some stalwart of the Malta Chamber of Commerce and Industry, or some big cheese in medicine and surgery, or some union boss. It should also have been written by one of Malta's large army of largely useless newspaper columnists, who seem to prefer telling us about their terribly trying first world problems with traffic and ambient noise. But there you go, Malta, the place where bad things happen because those who can stop them are either completely useless or too busy protecting their own interests, making hay while the sun shines or saving their neck while watching others go under the guillotine. In a strange secret deal with a shell company owned by unknown people, the government privatizes three public hospitals, St. Luke's, Karen Grech, and Gozo General, the only hospital serving that island. Daphne Caruana Galizia reveals that the contract has been fixed with the buyers before the public call for tenders was even published. She is the first to publish the secret contract exposing how incredibly one-sided it is. And she throws light on the fact that Conrad Mitzi's appointment to the health ministry, when he was already so busy with energy, must have had a lot to do with the corrupt nature of the deal. The government pushes back on criticism of the privatization. It says that the deal will bring about modernization of the hospitals, that patients will be better off as they continue to enjoy free medical care, and that a campus of the famed UK Barts Medical School will open in Gozo. There is no turning back from this commitment. Long before Vital's global healthcare won the competition to acquire the hospitals, the government's economy minister had signed a memorandum of understanding with them, making a farce of the tender process that was yet supposed to take place. The economy minister at the time was Labour's deputy leader, a politician who had once said in a speech at a party conference that he would respond to stabs of criticism by wielding an axe in response. That politician was Chris Cardona. Thirty first January, twenty seventeen. These are the facts. The Minister for the Economy was at a brothel called FKK Acapulco in Velbert, 30 minutes from Essen, where he had been invited to address a conference. Between 7 p.m. and around 10.30 p.m. last night, accompanied by his ministerial consultant, Joe Gerarda. They had a sauna, then a shower, then they went to the bar where they negotiated with a prostitute. Gerarda went into a room with the prostitute and after a couple of drinks, Cardona followed. All three of them were in the room together. They were there at the same brothel again this afternoon at 4 p.m. But I don't know what time they left because my source left before they did. Nor do I have any information on what they did there today, unlike yesterday night. I suspect it wasn't sex, but an attempt at getting hold of any video footage which will compromise them and or making sure that their backs are covered in other ways as journalists are now bound to start ringing for information. The story of a minister visiting a brothel during official business fits Chris Cardona's profile. Daphne Caruana Galizia has often reported and carried pictures of an inebriated Cardona staggering during office hours between his favourite shady watering holes. Daphne has also documented Chris Cardona's dubious friendships and contacts with the underworld. Most prominently, Labour's deputy leader counts as his protégé one David Gutt, who had been charged and later acquitted over a series of bank heists he was supposed to be preventing while he was a police inspector. At the time, the police had believed he was the one organising the heists. Chris Cardona applies his axe to a dagger principle to Daphne when she reports about his sexual encounter at the FKK Acapulco brothel. Together with his assistant, he files four libel suits against Daphne and gets the court to freeze her bank accounts to cover the maximum liability of all four suits. She is financially paralyzed. When Cardona's libel suits open, Daphne Caruana Galizia plays a card the minister does not expect. She asks the court to order the preservation of data held by mobile phone operators. This data is a record of where Cardona had been the night Daphne said he was having three-way sex in a brothel. Was he at the brothel or in his hotel, sleeping, as he claimed? 
Chris Cardona's lawyers fight tooth and nail to prevent the data from being preserved. When the court disagrees and the data is collected, Cardona postpones his testimony in court from one sitting to the next. Chris Cardona's paralyzing lawsuits do not stop Daphne digging up his questionable past. In the summer of 2017, she publishes a story revealing that he had been a director of a Bahamas company called Healy Properties Limited. The company owned a property at 52 Greek Street in the Soho district of London. The property had been raided by UK police because it was used for prostitution and human trafficking. Healy Properties Limited received so-called rental income from the property. This company had another director, another lawyer who comes to prominence in the middle of 2017. His name is Adrian Delia. Thirtieth June, twenty seventeen. We should have noticed already that Adrian Delia, who is being promoted hard and fast as the Nationalist Party's Moses, has no fighting spirit to speak of. Anybody with any kind of fighting spirit would have been out there fighting the Labour Party long ago. But Dr. Delia hasn't so much as written a Facebook comment or newspaper article. Even in the two interviews he gave. He had absolutely nothing to say about the government or the Labour Party, totally oblivious to the fact that he is going to be elected for no purpose other than to fight them. The focus of Adrian Delia's campaign to become leader of the Nationalist Party in the summer of 2017 is, indeed, not the Labour Party or the Labour government. Issues like the Panama Papers, the privatisation of the hospitals, the sale of passports to crooks, the abusive lawsuits filed by Chris Cardona to silence a journalist who exposed him, and the Electrogas power station barely feature in any of his speeches. Adrian Delia's focus is the Nationalist Party itself and the transformation he argues it needs to undergo to become electable again. He argues for the removal of an elite that controls the PN and has driven it aground through a series of electoral defeats and he especially wants the PN to distance itself from Daphne Caruana Galizia, who is, in the meantime, reporting on his past connections with the laundering of proceeds from prostitution. When Adrian Delia becomes the PN's leader in September 2017, Daphne Caruana Galizia writes that she expects the gap in support between the two political parties to widen. The PN will be losing the support of many people who want the opposition to pursue the government on corruption. Even as the country's opposition party changes course, Daphne's journalism in 2017 keeps uncovering the rot the government has, until now, hidden so successfully. As she had done with the East of 2016, when she knew more than she could let on, in 2017 she drops bait into the water, teasing her readers, tormenting the subjects of her investigation, secretly signalling people that do not yet know they need to be her sources, putting a picture together joining the dots and exposing herself to mortal danger. 22nd February 2017 17 Black The name of a company incorporated in Dubai In this post, she says even less than she had the previous year when she wrote about Conrad Mitzi's New Zealand lamb. The pictures accompanying the piece line up four of the principal bad guys of the era. And beneath the post, Daphne comments in response to a reader who links the existence of a Dubai company with the Panama structures set up for Keith Schembri, for Conrad Mitzi, and for that mysterious third owner. The conversation on the comments board quickly flows into the Electrogas deal, the government's decision to acquire a power station from a conglomerate that includes the prominent mega-loaded families of Upper Bologna, Gazan, and Fennec. And Daphne mentions the name of one Jorgen Fennec, Electrogas is at the centre of several impossible coincidences. It is part owned by the state-owned gas company of Azerbaijan. Since Joseph Muscat took office, links with Azerbaijan have mushroomed. After several secret meetings held between Joseph Muscat and Conrad Mitzi and their Azerbaijani counterparts in Baku, exposed by Daphne Caruana Galizia, Conrad Mitzi moved to force Malta's energy company to purchase fuel from this country. Through Electrogas, Malta will depend on Azerbaijan for its electricity as well. All the while, senior Azerbaijani ministers, world-renowned for corruption, and members of President Ilham Aliyev's family make use of the services offered by Pilata's bank, laundering money 
whose provenance is impossible to explain. If there had been any respect for the rules, the Electrogas Consortium could and would never have won the contract to supply Malta with energy for the next 18 years. The tender was drawn up within weeks of Labour's election in 2013. Brian Tonner and his company Nexia BT were given the job of writing the tender document. When the tender was published, Brian Tonner was given the front seat in the selection process and pretty much gifted the power to choose who would win it. Quite coincidentally, Brian Tonner's firm is also a service provider to one of the holding companies with a stake in Electrogas. As Brian Tonner was doing all this, he was also setting up offshore companies for Keith Schembri and Conrad Mitzi, and for mystery owner number three. The largest stake in the Electrogas consortium was held by an international firm called Gasol. Gasol would be bringing in the money to buy the power station. It was the partner with the capital. But before the project could start, Gasol went bust. And the capital vanished, and that should have been the end of that. It wasn't. The government leaned on Malta's Bank of Valletta to lend Electrogas the money, and gave Electrogas a contract promising to buy all the electricity it produced for the next 18 years, even if the country did not need it, or it could buy at a cheaper rate elsewhere. Daphne documents these manoeuvres that cannot be explained with reasonable logic, except by their being corrupt. In the meantime, behind the scenes, she is getting an understanding of this corrupt logic. She receives a mountain of evidence that shows the link between the procurement of energy from Electrogas, with bribes promised to Keith Schembri and Conrad Mitzi, at least, from someone who owns a Dubai company called Seventeen Black. While she digs through this information, the entire country is experiencing the fallout from another Daphne Caruana Galizia revelation. In the midst of her reporting on Pilatus Bank, exposing the dirty money that flows through that rotten structure, she comes upon evidence that answers a question that has been hanging since she first exposed the three Panama companies in 2016. One belonged to Keith Schembri, another to Conrad Mitzi. 20th April 2017. In the kitchen, at the offices of Pilatus Bank in Tajbish. There is a safe in which certain files are kept, and also particular documents marked for extreme secrecy. The safe used to be in the bank CEO's office, but for some reason was moved to the kitchen. In this safe, documents are held pertaining to Russian clients of the bank and to Maltese PEPs, including John Dunley, consultant to Prime Minister Muscat and Keith Schembri, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, both of whom have accounts with the bank in their personal names. The safe in the kitchen at Pilatus Bank also contains the documents that answer the question which the whole of Malta has been asking this past year. Who owns eGrant Inc? The third company Brian Tonner set up in Panama for somebody so important that the name had to be given over Skype rather than in an email, as it was for Conrad Mitzi and Keith Schembri. Those documents in the Pilatus Bank kitchen safe are declarations of trust, which show that shares in eGrant Inc. are held by Mossack Fonseca, nominees for Mrs. Michelle Muscat. The declarations of trust were provided to the bank by Brian Tonner as a prerequisite for opening an account for eGrant Inc for which the identity of the ultimate beneficial owner is required. Mrs. Muscat's name is also given on another document held in the bank's safe, the account opening form for eGrant Inc. When this is posted, a chain of events that feels greater than anything else that could be happening in the background starts unfolding. TV cameras catch Ali Sadr sneaking out of his bank late at night, carrying bags out of the building, Later, a private jet with no passengers on board takes off from Malta International Airport, flies straight to Baku in Azerbaijan, and then on to Dubai. Days later, the company operating the jet is given a 1 million euro sponsorship by the tourism ministry, even though no tourists use its services. Joseph Muscat initially claims that the allegations are so untruthful, they merit no investigation whatsoever. Then, his lawyers ask for an inquiry to start, effectively drawing up its terms of reference and limiting the questions it can ask. One question the inquiry is prohibited from asking is, who owns eGrant? 
Brian Tonna, in the meantime, volunteers the information that he owns E. Grant himself. The signatures in Michelle Muscat's name are dismissed by her husband as forgeries. Daphne Caruana Galizia's source in the bank, Maria Efimova, who outs herself to the inquiring magistrate and whose name is then leaked to the press, is accused by Joseph Muscat of spying for Russia. And as had happened a year earlier with her revelations on Keith Schembri and Konrad Mitzi, Joseph Muscat accuses Daphne Caruana Galizia of lying. This, he says, is the biggest lie in Malta's political history. He concludes that the people need to decide and cause a snap election, approximately a year ahead of time for June 3rd, 2017. Joseph Muscat wins with another landslide. Daphne Caruana Galizia pauses, briefly. She takes a couple of weeks off and focuses on her other interests, notably her lifestyle magazine. But nothing will keep Daphne away from her journalism. After all, as she put it, being right or wrong is not a popularity contest. 5th June, 2017. The electoral result shocked you. Not because you see general elections as football matches, in which the prize is unadulterated power for five years for your team, but because it makes you feel like the only sane person in the asylum. No, you are not wrong, because you think the police should act. No, you are not wrong to feel sick when the mob cheers a corrupt police officer. Of course you are not. You are right. The fight against corruption and the decimation of the rule of law must continue. The temptation now will be for people to see no way out of this horrible mess and to leap on the bandwagon with the cry that if you can't beat them, then you might as well join them. Nothing stops Daphne's fight against corruption and the decimation of the rule of law. She continues to write daily, often several times a day, documenting corruption and denouncing the impunity that protects it. 16th October, 2017. 35 past two in the afternoon. There are crooks everywhere you look now. The situation is desperate. Daphne Caruana Galizia is killed by a car bomb outside her house a few minutes before 3 p.m. on the 16th of October, 2017. Many of her stories are unfinished. Many of the people she exposed continue to deny any wrongdoing. They fully expect that her death would settle the question of whether she had been right about them. They fully expect Daphne's work to stop, even as her life does, abruptly and irrevocably. It doesn't. Twenty sixth January twenty eighteen. The week that Daphne Caruana Galizia is killed, several newsrooms in Malta receive threatening letters signed by a US law firm asking that their coverage of Daphne's reporting on Pilata's bank be withdrawn. They cannot reverse what is printed on their newspapers, but the record of their online versions needs to be wiped out. These newsrooms mainly reported what Daphne Caruana Galizia had exposed. In one case, a newspaper published through their online portal a detailed interview with Daphne's source, until then her voice altered. Quietly, under the cover of all the noise in the aftermath of Daphne's assassination, some of her most important journalistic stories are being wiped from history. At the same time as these letters are being sent out, lawyers acting for Pilatus Bank and for its owner, Ali Sada, covertly withdraw a defamation suit that they had filed against Daphne Caruana Galizia in Maricopa County, Arizona, USA. She had never known about it in her lifetime. Ali Sada and Pilatus Bank argue that all the reporting by Daphne about the laundering of money for criminals is nothing but lies. They claim to run a perfectly legitimate operation, well regulated by the authorities in Malta. Everything is as it should be, except the lies perpetrated against them by a disgruntled employee and the journalists speaking to her. Ali Sada's credentials, however, will prove less impressive. On 20th March 2018, Ali Sada is on one of his many trips to the United States. On his way back out of the country, he is nabbed by the FBI and charged in a federal court for six counts of bank fraud connected to activities that took place before he was given a license to open a European bank in Malta. 
That same night, Maria Efimova, the whistleblower who had exposed him, gives herself up to Greek authorities after months of avoiding an international arrest warrant issued against her by the Maltese police. The Greek courts reject Malta's request for her extradition. The US courts try Ali Sadr on six counts punishable by a lifetime in jail. Eventually, a jury finds him guilty. But the case against Ali Sada is dropped after prosecutors admit to discovery violations. Syed Ali Sada Hashaminejad now walks free. But Pilata's bank is no more. Finance Minister Edward Chikluna persists in his defense of Pilata's bank, but while the regulators he oversees give the bank a clean bill of health, the European Banking Authority intervenes. Pilata's bank is shut down. Subsequent investigations prove Daphne's reporting is substantially correct. She had been right about the bank's client profile. She had been right about its money laundering activities. She had been right about the shady character of the bank's owner and the reputational laundry provided by Henley and partners that allowed him to slip under the radar. She had been right about Keith Schembri and John Dunley banking at Pilata's bank. She had been right that honest regulators and law enforcement agents had tried to act against Pilata's bank. She had been right that they had been replaced by people who were happy to close one eye or both. Daphne was right. Pilata's bank has been shut down, but none of its directors, its owner or its clients have been charged for the crimes committed there. Charges have been issued against the defunct bank itself and a middle manager employed by it but the strong recommendations by a magisterial inquiry for proper criminal action to be undertaken continue to be ignored by the authorities. 21st December 2017 The mysterious owners of three privatized hospitals announced that they will be selling the hospitals to an American buyer. They have, by now, delivered none of the promised improvements to the buildings and to the services provided to patients. A new building that could serve as a medical school did emerge on the Gozo Hospital campus. But it is empty, and its costs have been paid for by the government, not by the so-called investors. By the end of their time in Malta, the hospital owners have run the business into the ground, and to pay their last batch of salaries, they stake St. Luke's Hospital as collateral for an emergency payday loan from the bank. And yet, in spite of failing on all fronts required of them in their contract with the government, the government gives them the biggest prize. They let them flip the deal and sell it for a profit to another owner. They have only held the hospital for 18 months. In that time, they are paid over 50 million euro, considerably more than their contract set out. On top of these payments, the government has paid for all staff salaries. Vitals have almost nothing to show for all the money they got, and in no time at all, they walk out counting their surplus profits from reselling the deal. Who are Vitals? Most of the owners' identities will remain hidden until after they sell their business. Some names are known. The deal is fronted by Ram Tumaluri, who has a record of insolvency, debt and failed business in Canada as exposed by Daphne Kawana Galizia. Another owner is Assad Ali Shaukat, a Maltese resident who held shares for some time in one of John Dudley's companies. Shaukat also holds shares in a medical supplies company called Technoline, which was given lucrative deals by Vitals. Daphne had been right about the VGH, that it had been fixed beforehand in an MOU signed by Chris Cardona. Indeed, VGH started recruiting staff the day after the MOU was signed and well before the tender was adjudicated and formally awarded. Daphne was right about the deal being flatly disadvantageous to the Maltese community. Daphne was right about the people that fronted vitals, that they were acting as covers for hidden interests. Daphne was right. The vitals deal would not last. Daphne was right in claiming that the presence of the mucky paws of Chris Cardona, Conrad Mitzi and John Dudley were alone red flags flying over this deal. A criminal inquiry into the conduct of ministers in the privatization deal is ongoing after a court agreed with NGO Republica that there were enough prima facie indications to justify the opening of an inquiry. To date, there have been no prosecutions in this case. Stewart Healthcare, the people who bought the three hospitals from Vitals, are negotiating with the government for massive compensation or, failing that, an early exit, free from pain for them. 
Joseph Muscat negotiated with the Maltese government on Stuart Healthcare's behalf, yet it seems that the project remains a doomed white elephant. Even as he was doing that, Joseph Muscat received payments from a company owned by the owners of VGH. Payments which Joseph Muscat dismisses as consultancy fees. He played both for both sides, just as Armin Ernst seems to have done when he flipped from leading VGH to the same position with Stuart Healthcare. The promised improvements to the provision of health services remain elusive. 6th February 2019 Daphne Caruana Galizia's widowed husband Peter and her sons Matthew, Andrew and Paul turn the tables on Chris Cardona. They open a court case against him after he chose to drop his libel case against their mother. Days after she had been killed, Daphne's family went to court for scheduled sittings of the libel cases Cardona had filed against Daphne in the wake of the brothel scandal she had exposed. Daphne's family told the court they would continue to defend the case. Like their mother before them, they would insist that Chris Cardona testifies as to why he sued their mother and then stick around to see what the mobile phone data says about where he was the night she said he had been in a brothel. For the case he himself instituted, Chris Cardona never showed up in court. One session after another, his lawyer bought time, kicking the can down the road, until the court had enough and interpreted Chris Cardona's absence as the surrender of the case. The location data is never seen, but neither is Chris Cardona's denial under oath in court of Daphne's reporting ever heard. So her story stands. Daphne was right. 21st April 2021 The Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation was set up by her surviving family members to preserve Daphne's legacy and to vindicate her work. In April 2021, they publish The Passport Papers, completing the investigations that Daphne had started in 2013 when she first exposed the government's plans to sell Maltese and consequently European citizenship for money. The investigation confirms beyond doubt that the so-called genuine link passport acquirers had to have with Malta before being granted citizenship is nothing short of crass fiction, institutionalized fraud. Applicants are granted points for spending a few hours in Malta, subscribing to a membership in a sports or social club they never visit, paying a local lawyer to handle their application, open a bank account, and sign up for a local mobile phone number. All these arrangements are artificial constructs, disguising the complete detachment between Malta and its new citizens. The investigations confirm the stories Daphne had published, that addresses in Malta supplied by passport acquirers are fictitious, pointing to uninhabitable garages or pokey uninhabited apartments where more billionaires are supposed to be living than even the poorest could be crowded in a slum. The passport papers even find lease agreements meant to prove that applicants have been, for years, living in apartments several floors above ground on building sites where construction has not yet started. In the time since Daphne started her passport investigations, many have been exposed using it to hide their crimes. Pavel Menlikov's Finnish real estate firm was raided for fronting a giant money laundering operation. Mustafa Abdel Wadud awaits trial for fraud in the US. Liu Zongtian has been indicted for smuggling of metals. Arkady Voloj, Boris Mintz and Alexander Nessis have been fingered for sanctions because of their proximity to Vladimir Putin. All these and others may call themselves Maltese thanks to the passport selling scheme. Daphne was right that the scheme created the opportunity for crooks to use Malta for their criminal ends. She was right that the scheme required the complicity of corrupt institutions who would have to close their eyes to the lies on the passport applications. Daphne was right that the scheme would scupper Malta's reputation as a reliable financial services jurisdiction. Malta's passport selling setup persists, even as other countries with similar schemes drop theirs. The European Commission has started a legal process against Malta arguing that the sale of European citizenship by a member state goes against the Treaty of European Union. 8th January 2018 Louise Dalli and Claire Gauci-Borda, John Dalli's daughters, are charged in court, accused of fraud and masterminding a Ponzi scheme to defraud investors out of their life savings. This scam had been exposed by Daphne Caruana Galizia. She had published evidence of John Dudley's trips to the Bahamas to meet with his co-conspirator Eloise Marie Corbin Klein and others. Klein, together with four other collaborators, are also charged, 
but all five elderly fraudsters have since died, having never been properly notified to appear in the Maltese courts. The case against Dalli and Gauci Borda is still ongoing, but the evidence brought against them is compromised by incompetence or worse, on the state side. Mysteriously, John Dalli has never been charged over a scheme in which he was clearly intimately involved. And it took 10 years for the police to charge John Dudley, the disgraced EU commissioner. He has finally been accused in court for his role in the scheme to solicit 60 million euro in bribes when he was EU commissioner. On 30th October 2017, 14 days after Daphne Caruana Galizzi was killed, Times of Malta published an opinion piece by John Dudley, where he appears to speak of Daphne's killing as an act of self-defense by her killers. He stops short of claiming responsibility for the murder, but it damn well sounds to some like he wishes he could take the credit for it. Freud would have had a field day. Daphne Caruana Galizia was right about John Dudley's early association with Joseph Muscat. She was right about the scam John Dudley organized to defraud innocent victims in the USA. She was right about the police cover-up of John Dudley's crime and about the impact of his promotion to advise Prime Minister Joseph Muscat on health matters. John Dudley continues to deny any wrongdoing and is consistent in accusing his critics of slandering him. 29th March 2021 A cross-border journalistic investigation being conducted by Reuters, Times of Malta and other partners exposes Cheng Chen, a senior executive for Accenture, who negotiated the purchase of a stake in Malta Zenimalta on behalf of the Shanghai Electric Power Company as the owner of a secret Dubai company called MacBridge. MacBridge is short for Malta China Bridge. Leaks from Mossack Fonseca, published over two years before, established that MacBridge was identified by Nexia BT as a target client that would pay Keith Schembri and Conrad Mitzi $2 million in their Panama companies exposed by the Panama Papers. The new investigation shows that MacBridge was held in the name of a woman called Tang Zhao Min, journalists expose Tang as Cheng's mother-in-law. By the time Cheng's ultimate interest in the company set up to bribe Conrad Mitzi and Keith Schembri emerges, the Chinese negotiator surfaces to public attention again. Another press investigation reveals that Cheng Chen negotiated a deal for Enimalta to purchase rights for a wind farm in Montenegro. Cheng Chen had contacted Nexia BT to evaluate the project. At the same time, Nexia BT set up an offshore company for Cheng Chen. The Montenegro deal would be conducted through a mysterious intermediary who made a profit of almost 5 million euro by flipping the rights to the Montenegro farm in the space of a few days. The intermediary was a company part-owned by Jorgen Fenech. Daphne was right about Cheng Chen's illicit relationship with the government officials, individuals who are supposed to be at the opposite end of the table negotiating the sale of part of Enimalta. Daphne was right about Conrad Mitzi and Keith Schembri, that they stood to gain from that part privatization. No criminal action has been taken against the participants of either the MacBridge swindle or more specifically the Montenegro scandal. The consequential loss of money in the rotten deal was covered by Maltese taxpayers through Enimalta. 20th March 2021 Keith Schembri, along with several other people, including his father, accused of conspiring with him, spends his first night at Cordine Prison, denied bail by the court for charges of corruption, criminal conspiracy and money laundering. The arrest of Keith Schembri comes after a magistrate concluded a four-year inquiry requested by then-opposition leader Simon Buzutil, asking the court to investigate payments made by Keith Schembri to Adrian Hillman and others at Allied Newspapers Limited. The magistrate found in her inquiry evidence that suggests that Keith Schembri paid kickbacks to Allied newspaper managers in offshore accounts set up for the purpose by Brian Tonner of Nexia BT. The charges concern matters that happened before Keith Schembri made it to the Prime Minister's office in 2013. But like the charges against Ali Sadr in New York, about crimes believed to have happened before he ever set up Pilatus Bank, the Allied newspaper scandal gives insight into the methods and the character of the man who would become Malta's second most powerful government official, or its first, some would argue. The case against Keith Schembri and his accomplices is ongoing. He denies any wrongdoing, Due to illness, he stopped attending court sessions of the case against him. 
he is now believed to have returned to his business activities. Daphne Caruana Galizia was right. In spite of his vehement denials, Daphne's revelations about Keith Schembri's conduct in the Allied newspaper scandal were substantiated by the evidence that now forms the bulk of the state's case against him, and Daphne's reporting into Adrian Hillman's activities now forms the basis of the case of the prosecution against him. Daphne was right about Keith Schembri and how he could not properly explain the payments he received from Brian Tonner transferred into his Pilatus bank account. Daphne was right when she reported that Keith Schembri's health was at risk. All the protestations that her reporting was false and intrusive would prove hollow. Keith Schembri, like Conrad Mitzi, has faced no charges for his involvement in the Panama scandal. The allegations of bribery and corruption he was involved in while serving in the Prime Minister's office are denied but not cleared. And yet, no police action has started in respect of these either. 9th November 2018 A Reuters investigation reveals that the owner of 17 Black is Jorgen Fenech. Earlier that year, the press uncovered documents compiled by Nexia BT briefing Mossack Fonseca that, alongside MacBridge, 17 Black would pay Keith Schembri and Conrad Mitzi's Panama companies some $5,000 every day. Evidence in court, heard since the killing of Daphne Caruana Galizia, shows Daphne had learned that these offshore structures were set up by Brian Tonner to enable the payment of bribes. Apart from his family's stake in Electrogas, Jorgen Fenech holds a personal share in the business. Daphne had understood that some of those profits were going to make their way into the pockets of Keith Schembri and Conrad Mitzi. It was reasonable to expect such a revelation to irreparably harm the reputation of the government and to expose the Electrogas project to the risk of it being rescinded on grounds of corruption. We will learn that Jorgen Fenech, the owner of 17 Black, was at the center of an informal network of corruption, a web that brought together criminals and politicians, that Joseph Muscat and Keith Schembri share a WhatsApp group with Jorgen Fenech, exchanging pictures of food and women, that Fenech pays tribute to Muscat, gifting him with fine and rare wine vintages and designer wristwatches worth many thousands of euro. Jorgen Fenech keeps up a close relationship with senior police officers, the head of the Criminal Investigation Department at the police, Silvio Valletta, travels at Fenech's expense to watch football matches and they spend time together at Fenech's ranch. Jorgen Fenech keeps up a friendship with Melvin Telma, who runs an underground lottery business and who eventually will testify in court admitting to procuring assassins for Fenech when he needed someone killed. Jorgen Fenech engages in a sexual affair with at least one member of parliament and nurtures close friendships with several others including the incumbent Justice Minister, Edward Zamit Lewis. Jorgen Fenech intervenes in politics with his considerable resources. He meddles in internal elections within the Labour Party and negotiates the nomination of candidates by the Nationalist Party. Jorgen Fenech's friendships influence the conduct of ministers and people in political power. A short meeting with Planning Minister Michael Farrugia was immediately followed by a permit to build lucrative high-rises in Imriel. Edward Zamit Lewis sought his approval after making public statements rebuffing Simon Bozutil's efforts to have the 17 Black scandal investigated. Adrian Dalia scheduled lunch with him after Jorgen Fenech was named the owner of 17 Black while avoiding mentioning him by name at all. Daphne was right. Covering up the 17 Black scandal forced Joseph Muscat to anticipate the general election by a year. She was right about the Panama structures. They were set up to line the pockets of ministers in return for granting Jorgen Fenech and his partners the energy contract. She was right that it did not make any commercial sense to award Electrogas its contract on the agreed terms. Daphne Caruana Galizia was right that people with a stake in the Electrogas deal had many reasons to fear their exposure. Jorgen Fenech has not yet been charged for any crime connected with the bribery of Keith Schembri and Conrad Mitzi. He has not yet been charged with money laundering and with tax evasion using his Dubai accounts. And like his associates, he denies any and all wrongdoing. 22nd July 2018 A tearful Joseph Muscat says he is relieved that the nightmare, as he calls it, that started when Daphne Caruana Galizia reported that shares in Panama Company e-grant were held by his wife, is now over. A magistrate has just concluded the inquiry that started the April of the previous year 
and after a 1,500 pages of evidence and several hours of witness depositions, the magistrate announces he has found no evidence to back the claim that either Michelle Muscat or her husband owned E. Grant. The magistrate instead found so-called falsified documents and forged signatures that may have been part of the basis for Daphne Caruana Galizia's reporting. Joseph Muscat claims that he is entitled to feel vindicated, that this proves him innocent. His opposite number, leader of opposition Adrian Delia, certainly agrees and immediately announces that he will dismiss his predecessor, Simon Buzatil, from the party as punishment for following up on Daphne's reporting. Joseph Muscat also declares that the inquiry conclusions vindicate his decision to persist in pursuing Daphne's mourning family for the defamation case he had filed against Daphne Caruana Galizia when she was still alive. Later, he will profess that he would be prepared to withdraw the libel case if Daphne's family acknowledge that she had been wrong about E. Grant and that he had been right. But Joseph Muscat's hope for definitive and absolute vindication remain frustrated. The inquiry itself is severely criticized for taking at face value evidence given by former employees of Mossack Fonseca, themselves facing multiple prosecutions for fraud and forgery all over the world. A separate inquiry into Pilata's bank finds fresh evidence that leads it to recommend that the e-grant inquiry is reopened. The recommendation is ignored. When Keith Schembri will be arraigned and charged with money laundering in the Allied newspapers case, the prosecution's case will include multiple documents forged and falsified by Nexia BT. Nexia BT's Brian Tonner had openly admitted that E. Grant had been his. His credibility, such as it had been, will be severely dented when he's charged with fraud and forgery himself in a separate case involving Keith Schembri. Calls for the E. Grant inquiry to be reopened remain unheeded. Its author is promoted to a judgeship by Joseph Muscat soon after he acquits Joseph Muscat. And yet the question remains, who owns or who owned E. Grant? Whatever the answer to that question may ever prove to be, Daphne Kawana Galizia was right that her source had not been spying for Russia. Her revelations about the endemic and systematic money laundering at Pilata's bank proved accurate. Daphne's intuition that Keith Schembri and Konrad Mitzi's Panama structures were the tail end of a corrupt infrastructure was entirely correct. And Daphne was right that Keith Schembri, Konrad Mitzi and Jorgen Fenech could not hope to get away with what they did or tried to do without the protection of Joseph Muscat. Ministers will testify in a public inquiry that Joseph Muscat is sheer in number one, il kink, and all the other terms of endearment used by criminals when speaking of him repeatedly rejected advice to fire Schembri and Mitzi. Edward Shikluna will admit that, although he was the finance minister, he was excluded from all the important decisions. Everest Bartolo will admit that he had not done enough to ensure that the laws that bind lowly animals apply also for the gods that propped up Joseph Muscat. George Vella, as president, will remind the country that the gang that put Malta to shame was not representative of the national spirit. Daphne had seen all this, and Daphne had written and spoken about all of it. Before it found its way into the conclusions of the independent public inquiry, which Joseph Muscat publicly declared he accepts, Daphne had understood and explained what had happened to Malta under Muscat's watch. You come here to feel normal, in a sea of insanity, where the crowd cheers the commissioner of police for failing to take action against a corrupt cabinet minister and the prime minister's chief of staff, where supporters of the party in power celebrate and have their picture taken on the steps of a bank which launders money for Azerbaijan's ruling elite because it is linked to the politicians they support where even educated people, who have had all the advantages in life, vote a corrupt political party into power for the narrow reason that they're renting out flats to buyers of Maltese citizenship who never set foot in them. Malta is in a dangerous place. And now we can no longer say that it is corrupt politicians who have brought it to this point. For it can no longer be denied that those corrupt politicians are a reflection of society. There is something else I should say before I go. When people taunt you or criticize you 
for being negative, or for failing to go with their flow, for not adopting an attitude of benign tolerance to their excesses. And bear in mind always that they, and not you, are the ones who are in the wrong. Daphne was right.